Hey, what's up? This is Mark at Alchemist.camp, where we learn by building things. Today, I'm going to answer a question from subscribers and listeners and even people I've met at various meetups. And that question is, what's a good tech stack to learn next? Now, this question usually comes in the form of a really long email or direct message or preamble when we're talking in person where they tell me all about you know, what programming languages and tech stacks they already know and what they're hoping to do. I just wanna answer this in a more general way. I'm gonna look at complementary versus competitive languages or frameworks or just about anything. This is a pretty broadly applicable idea. So let's start with two similar languages and I would consider this to be competitive. So say C and Pascal. In the late 80s, early 90s, there was a time when they were about equally popular, and they're both very similar languages. They're both uh, very low level. They both involve managing pointers yourself, allocating your own memory, and they give you total control over what you want to build, but the cost of actually having to do everything yourself, and also the risk of fairly serious errors if there are any mistakes in the memory management. Now, if you could already use either C or Pascal really well, what's the advantage of learning the other? Well, having another tool that's good at doing the same thing doesn't let you accomplish much more if you're working on your own, but there's still some value. You could, uh, you could for example, work at a company that's using the other one, and that, that broadens your opportunities by a bit. Uh, same sort of situation with Java and .NET. They're both a bit newer, they're a little bit higher level, but still, uh, I'd say mid-level languages where you get very high performance and it's a fair amount of work to get things done, but not anywhere near as extreme as C or Pascal because they manage memory for you. And uh, similarly, if a company was a .NET shop, they would tend to use very little Java. They would do everything they could do in .NET with .NET and just buy into the whole ecosystem. And uh, vice versa, if it's a Java shop, they will do uh, very likely everything in Java and have no .NET whatsoever. So learning the other language in this case might actually have negative value because the ecosystems are, are very complex. And if you know a moderate amount of the .NET ecosystem and a moderate amount of the Java ecosystem, that's actually not as, as appealing to an employer as someone who knows their ecosystem extremely well. Now, sometimes the comparisons are a little bit less clear. So Elixir and Scala, for example, both excel at highly concurrent fault tolerant systems. Elixir has this built into the VM and has some real advantages over Scala in terms of both ergonomics and the level of fault tolerance you get. Uh, however, Scala runs on the JVM, which makes it uh, much better for numeric computing tasks. So there, there's a huge scope of tasks where either one would make perfect sense. There's some where it's clearly better to use Elixir, some where it's clearly better to use Scala. Same thing with Ruby and Python. They're very similar high level languages, very productive. Uh, you're not gonna get great performance out of them, but either one can interface with, uh, with C, which we'll talk about more in a bit. And uh, there are some differences though, like Python is much more popular as a language in, in many more fields, especially in scientific computing and machine learning. And it's not that Ruby couldn't do those same things, but the ecosystem for the libraries isn't there. And similarly, Ruby is slightly more expressive. It's significantly better for writing a DSL. And if you're making a web app, there is nothing in Python that will get you the same level of productivity as Ruby on Rails. Uh, there are some attempts like Django, but uh, it's not quite as good at that task. So maybe it would make sense for you to have a, a web app written in Ruby on Rails that interfaces with a machine learning backend that's written in Python, or it's actually Python wrappers around C++ libraries, but the API is all Python. Uh, or it might make sense to do uh, certain one-liners, like you, you might use Perl in a Unix environment, 
um, just inspecting things from the command line it might make sense to do that in Ruby, even if most of your application code is in Python. Now Rust and Golang are both build as systems level languages, but they have even more differences than Elixir and Scala, far more differences than Ruby and Python. And Rust is a bit lower level. With Rust, you're going to be managing your own memory. With Golang, uh, you're not running in a VM, but it is handling memory management for you. So you'll be compiling binaries where you don't have to worry about pointers. And another big difference is Golang is a very simple, almost C-like language. It's like a tiny update on 1970s style programming languages. And it only has, I believe, 25 keywords, something like that. And Rust is a very modern, complex language. So the learning curve is a lot steeper with Rust, especially if someone doesn't have experience with many modern languages. So there are a lot of cases where you could either use Rust or you could use Golang and it would make perfect sense, especially with a lot of server infrastructure. There are a lot of other cases where you would definitely want to use Rust or you would definitely want to use Golang. So let's look at some languages that are clearly different. I would call these complementary. Uh, Ruby and Golang is a very popular combination. Uh, Ruby on Rails, as I mentioned before, is extremely productive. It's beloved by startups. Out of the top 10 Y Combinator funded startups ever by valuation, six of them ran on Ruby or still run on Ruby. And most of those are actually running Rails. However, Rails is, uh, for all the wonderful things about it, it's not going to be the most performant thing. And as startups get larger, they often uh, rewrite part of their infrastructure, which was Ruby, especially the performance critical parts of it, in a lower level language. And I think that's why we see a lot of startups that were using Ruby for everything, or Python, or PHP, any sort of similar, very high level language. A lot of them are writing some services in Golang and not that many startups that wrote everything in Java or .NET are doing the same. The reason is they just didn't gain enough out of it. It just wasn't enough faster or enough different that it was worth it. They could just keep everything within Java. Um, another even more extreme comparison would be Python and C++. Python is a very high level general purpose language. It's extremely productive. And it's also slow, even a bit slower than Ruby. C++ is the other extreme. It's crazy fast. You get full control of everything, but it's a lot of work and it's really easy to make catastrophic mistakes. So in order to get the best of both worlds, a lot of projects have Python interfaces and all the performance critical parts of them are basically just C++ with Python wrappers. This is true of uh, NumPy for numerical processing, SciP for scientific computing, a lot of Python's machine learning libraries, and it makes perfect sense. Java and Swift is a bit different. So here it's not so much that what the languages can do is so different, but it's that the ecosystems are different. Basically, if you're making a mobile app, Java and Swift don't occupy the same space simply because Google isn't going to make an Android SDK for Swift developers, and Apple isn't going to make an iOS one for Java developers. So if you're going to write an Android app, you're basically going to use Java, or you're going to use something else on the JVM, likely Kotlin. A few people have also done uh, Scala Android apps. That's not so popular, though. And if you're working with iOS, you know, it's your go-tos are really just Swift or Objective-C, though there are a few other projects like uh, Ruby Motion or something like that. Um, Ruby and Python, in the context of where you've got a web server and machine learning backend, like I described, that might make sense. Although there's so much overlap between the two languages, if it's the same person or the same team maintaining both, they would probably just write everything in Python. And how about Elixir and Rust? This is one a lot of people ask me about. 
probably because I teach Elixir on the internet. And it's actually an amazingly good pair. The reason for that is Elixir is really good at making web servers, particularly its fault tolerance and concurrency are what it's known for. It's, uh, I would say the Erlang virtual machine is the one VM out there that's even more stable than the JVM. It's got a fantastic track record for that. That's why telecom systems use Erlang. However, it's not very good at all at numerical computing. It's not good at number crunching in general. For that kind of task, its performance is on par with something like Ruby, Python, PHP. So historically, a lot of people have used uh, C with Erlang. They write some natively invoked functions in C called NIFs, N-I-F. Then they compile those and can run them from the Erlang virtual machine. Problem is, if there are any of those many kinds of memory management errors that I mentioned before, and they crash, that can take down the entire Erlang virtual machine and you lose all of the fault tolerance and stability that Elixir and Erlang are famous for. With Rust, you don't have that problem because Rust uh, Rust's real selling point isn't that it's low level. I mean, that's that's part of the deal, but the real thing is it's low level and it's safe. With Rust, you can get guarantees from the compiler that you don't have any sort of uh, issues where you've got a pointer that's supposed to stick within the bounds of an array and it, it escapes them and then you're overriding all kinds of system memory. You can be guaranteed that won't happen if your program compiles and you didn't use any unsafe blocks. So if you're using Rust to write your natively invoked functions, while they may have an error that causes them not to work correctly, that error isn't going to take down your entire Erlang virtual machine, so your web app will stay up. So this is, this is actually a particularly good combination, although you'd have to, obviously you'd have to uh, find people that are okay with newer languages in order to do this. And the last two here are a bit different. In their respective domains, JavaScript and C complement pretty much anything else that makes sense in that domain. For example, if you're writing a web server or if you're writing a web app, you really do need to understand JavaScript, at least to some degree, and that's because it's the language that runs in browsers. Even if you're using a different language that compiles into JavaScript, you still have to deal with external libraries and the entire ecosystem and documentation that's assuming you're using JavaScript. So knowing some JavaScript will help you out with anything you write on the back end. Uh, you might be using Ruby on Rails, you might be using PHP, you might have Java backend, Elixir backend you still get something out of understanding JavaScript. And on the flip side, uh, JavaScript is not the ideal language to be running on the server. It's not gonna be the fastest, it's not gonna be the most fault tolerant, it's not going to be the safest, it's not going to, uh, it's not going to be ideal for most larger applications. Although it, you know, it works well enough, you could do everything with JavaScript, and a lot of people do, just so that they don't need to learn another language. And a bit lower on the stack, the same is true of C. It pairs well with pretty much anything. A lot of that's historical since Unix was written in C. Most other mainstream operating systems were written in C++. And you'll see C interfaces for everything. And there will be, you know, there are C interfaces in all of these higher level languages listed here. And it's pretty common, actually, even for, say, mobile apps, there will be a binary part or a native part of it that's written in C because both Android and iOS have bridges to interface the code that you've written in either Java or Swift with C. And in the case of a lot of ambitious cross-platform mobile apps, the core business logic or in the case of a game, game logic will all be written in C or C++, and then interface with either Java or Swift UI code. So 
it's pretty applicable just about anywhere. Um, so maybe maybe that says something that JavaScript or C are just good languages to know something about um, if you're in one of those those respective domains. The common thread here that runs through all of these complementary pairs is one tool accomplishes what the other cannot. Often there's no choice but to add another tool to the tech stack. If you are GitHub and you've written everything in Ruby on Rails and you become one of the largest, most popular sites on the internet, uh, Ruby just is not going to be fast enough for everything. So they rewrote some critical paths in C. If you have an iOS app and want to make an Android app, Google isn't going to let you use the same SDK. So there's a reason to use a different tool. In the case of something where it's questionable, like Ruby and Python or Elixir and Scala, Rust and Golang, the idea I tend to think about is keeping boundaries as crisp as possible. Try to reduce the duplication of what the two tools can handle for two reasons. One is it increases your reach. The other reason is say you've got a lot of code written in Rust and a lot of code written in Golang, there are going to be large parts of your application domain that either one would make sense for. And say you have a team where some of the programmers are working mostly in Golang, some of them are working mostly in Rust, they may both want to work on the same things. Same deal if you have Elixir and Scala both in your stack. You don't want to have indecision about what tool to use for what thing. So say instead of Rust and Golang, you had Rust and Python, or you had uh, Golang and C, there would be a really clear choice of when to use what. You know, if you need to manage memory yourself, you use C. If not, you use Golang. Or if it's something that Python is too slow for, you use Rust. So basically, you want to have as few questions as possible about which to be using. And then, as I said, you increase your reach. Now, this is true both of individuals and teams. If you're an individual, you can build more things yourself if you know both high-level and low-level languages, or if you know, you know both uh, iOS and Android development. For a team, you can increase your reach if you have the same knowledge but spread around multiple people. So that's my general thought about what's a good thing to learn next. And just like there are these, uh, these languages like JavaScript and C that work well with anything, there are also you know, frameworks that, or, or protocols that work well with anything. Like you know, no matter what language you're learning, it's probably worth your time to learn something about regular expressions or learn how to use an editor really well. So that's it for today. Hope you found it useful. Click the bell, click subscribe, and see you next time.